Uh, it is my privilege to bring God's word uh, this morning. Today, uh, we'll be looking at a topic, broken but chosen, chosen by God. If you have your Bibles this morning, we are going to look at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting from verse 10. Verse 10 to 17. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there will be no division among you, but that you perfectly join together in the same mind and in the same judgment, for it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Choleus household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you say, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Christus and Gaius lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beside, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. So my friends here in Corinth, a powerful cosmopolitan city, Inside the church, there is divisions. There is divisions where people are identifying with certain leaders and glorifying leaders, giving them titles, magnifying them. And Paul, writing this text, is asking us, has Christ been chopped off into pieces? When we have divisions in our life, in the church? Has Christ been broken into pieces? My friends, it's easy to magnify and glorify and exalt someone you can see. Even it could be godly leaders, it's easy to glorify and lift them up. But here in the text this morning, it's warning us, if we do that, there will be division. Just like the text here, Perhaps, as the church, do you identify and glorify a certain man? Do you put him on a pedestal? I, mean, I used to do that sometimes as a young believer, when I looked at internet preachers, etc. And if you put them on a pedestal, and when they fall, what happens to your faith? Christ didn't change. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But because we have placed and exalted earthly leaders, our faith sometimes can get shattered. So my friends, do you exalt and magnify leaders? If we do that, the cross loses its focus. And Messiah is chopped into little pieces. Abraham Lincoln once said, Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Give him power. Theology of glory versus the theology of the cross. It's so easy even for churches to just glory, to embrace the theology of glory, glorifying so many things, glorifying even perhaps our own lives, our blessings, leaders, etc. Versus, we'll see later on, the text goes on to say, you know, how amazing Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ, the crucified one, is so amazing, awesome. Or oh, are we glorifying the cross? particularly when times are tough and hard and difficult, when everything is broken. 
Are we clinging on to that old rugged cross and he is our hope and our salvation? Many things in this world will disappoint you and disappoint me. It could be a good godly relationship. It could be a business transaction. It could be a government. My friends, all these things, even good things might disappoint you. But can we this morning place our trust once again? in the crucified Jesus Christ. The theology of the cross. Who are we going to elevate in this broken system? Who gets the credit? Is it God or man? My agenda, my kingdom, my following? Or his kingdom, his following? Perhaps I will say, look at me, I'm on a pedestal, I'm elevated. How handsome I look. Handsome Dan, you want to be my follower? Come on. You can be handsome as well, you can be popular, you can be a great person. Come and join my clan. And if you were to Google handsome Dan, Google has got it wrong actually. If you Google handsome Dan, you get a bulldog. You get a bulldog. Right? So you might actually exalt certain leaders and want to emulate them. And you might have to take a puppy with you back home. <laughs> the followers are putting the leaders on a pedestal. There's danger to the church. We can have our own groupings. We can have our own followers. We can give them glory. We can put them on a pedestal. And that's what the church in Corinth did. And Christ was divided. The church lost its focus. It's not my agenda. It's Jesus Christ's agenda. He alone is the one who should be exalted. And just like John the Baptist, my friends, pray. Pray for all the leaders that we will reduce, we will reduce, and Jesus Christ would increase, just like John the Baptist, who baptized Jesus. Those were the words and prayers of his heart, that men will reduce, and the Lord Jesus Christ will be exalted. Message version states in verse 17, God didn't send me out to collect the following for myself, but to preach the message of what he has done, collecting a following for him. So my role, your role, my friends, is to collect not a following for yourself, to collect a following for Jesus Christ. Let him be exalted. And if you want to praise, if you want to praise, let's go to the bottom of the passage there. 31. He who glories... If you want to glory, let him glory in the Lord. If you want to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God. That's how message version translates that version. You want to praise? You want to lift on and exalt people? Blow a trumpet for God. Let his name be known, particularly during times such as this, when people are looking for answers where people are wondering where their next meal would come from, when they don't know a business plan for their businesses that are crumbling. No dollars. In such hopeless situations, can we present the story of Jesus Christ that there is a God who loves them? Surely the, the, the Lord loved me when I was lost. When I was lost, he loved me. He cared for me. He directs me. Many times I stumble. Many times I stumble. And I'm so grateful for His grace. So grateful. And it's free. Freely available. My friend, the freely available grace. Why can't we give it out to others into this broken world? Let's give out His grace. Not for our glory. For His glory. For His exaltation. 
the system is broken and Jesus Christ is the only true answer. As we continue the passage, verse 18, it's going to talk about wisdom, broken, broken wisdom. What do we trust? What is true to us? There was once a town fool. Let's call him Anil. Anil was a town fool. He used to live in Malvatta village. And people used to come to town fool Anil at Malvatta village and offer him money. On one hand, they had 1,000 rupees. On the other hand, they had 100 rupees. And Anil used to always choose the 100 rupees. And people were shocked. He's such a fool. Why is he choosing the lesser amount? And lots and lots of people used to come to Anil. He became a spectacle. Look at Anil. He's such a fool. He's taking the 100 rupees. Someone from out of town came and asked Anil, Anil, why are you taking the lesser amount? Don't you know the difference between the 1,000 rupees and 100 rupees? Then Anil said, of course I do. If I choose the 1,000 rupees, the game will begin to end. And he became the he became the mayor of that town. Who are the fools, my friends? Who are the fools? The people in the town? Or oh, Anil? What is wisdom? What is wisdom? Sometimes we might think wisdom is systems out there. Maybe what university lecturers would proclaim is truth. Is that truly wisdom? Let's look at God's word. Starting from verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So it's foolish. You know, the cross is foolishness, they say. The world out there would say it's foolishness. But for us, it is the power of God particularly during times such as this. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? When Corona struck, it didn't matter whether you had a million dollar bank account or whether you had nothing. When petrol queues line up here, a lot of our systems are falling apart. Wisdom of the world has become foolish. And my friends, not just in Sri Lanka, you just look around you. Look at what's going on around the world. Economic theories, wars, etc. All these things are failing us. Food security, poverty, hunger. We are supposed to be one of the most uh, educated, uh, educated generations ever. Right? In the 20th century, um, it's the, there were more wars fought in the 20th century compared to the entire 19th century before that. We be can become more educated with time. That doesn't mean our morals are being affected. We have a moral decay. Systems are decaying. And we have to come back to God's word. Let's continue. Where I start again, verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the dispute of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to, uh, preached to save who believe. 
for Jews request a sign and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The wisdom of the world will keep us wanting, leave us wanting. It won't satisfy us. Wisdom of the world might give you food on the plate, but won't satisfy your soul. The deepest longings, your significance, your trials, your tragedies, your brokenness, despair. The wisdom of the world has no answers. But the crucified Lord Jesus Christ does. If there is anyone here and you have not tasted his goodness, my friends, open your heart to him, the crucified Jesus Christ. And if there are others, perhaps like myself, who gets distracted with the busyness of life, can we come back and may our eyes be focused once again on the crucified Jesus Christ? You bring your problems, your hurts, and put it at the cross. And may, he, he, may his risen victory at the cross be victory for you. He called us to be more than conquerors. More than conquerors when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He is with us. When we are in the petrol queues, he is with us. When we don't know where our next paycheck will come from. He is with us. He knows your pain. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He's a God who, a God of details. He knows you. Knows your pain and knows your hurt. Come to him, surrender to him. And my friends, do we really have a choice? Do we really have a choice? You can clench your fist at God. Where else can you turn to? Where else can you turn to? If we are really honest with ourselves and we meditate on, you don't have to look at this, we meditate on Romans 3. How no one is righteous, not even one. And that's the, uh, that's the status of humanity, that none of us are righteous, not even one. Our mouths are like open graves, our throats. And in such a context, God gives grace. His grace is amazing, so sweet. The fact is, we are inside an aeroplane that is crashing. That is crashing. That's the state of the world. It's crashing. God is there wanting to rescue us. Would you let go of your own will and come to him? Let him take that aeroplane and let him soar like the eagles. He can take something that's broken, take, put it together, something so beautiful. Forget Elon Musk's rocket. The rocket Jesus will give you. Your life is amazing. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for you, my friends, my brothers and sisters. God has amazing plans for you. Let go of your little dinky plans. Let go. Come to him. Open your eyes. No mind has conceived his plans for you. That's what God's word states. Let's let go of our doubts, our personal agendas, our bitterness, our conflicts, our anger. Let go. Come to him. Come to him. The crucified Christ brings salvation. Purging our pain and our sin, giving us meaning and significance. Not human merit, not intellect. It's a pure gift from God. Grace. Our hearts, I hope this morning, will cry out just like the hymn writer 
Nothing in my hand I bring. Slim, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. That's what the hymn writer, Rock of Ages, stated as he proclaimed his heart devoted to our God. Don't let this opportunity, these difficult times go by without drawing close to our living God. But you know what's more amazing as we continue the text? It's not that we have to try hard to do this. Let's continue. Verse 28. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put shame to the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things that are despite God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring nothing that are, that no flesh should glorify, glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Three times here it states that God has chosen you and me. Now, who, who does the choosing? Who does the choosing? Do you do the choosing? Or is it God? Who does the choosing? The texts seem to imply pretty strongly that God does the choosing. Now I do uh, business, I run my own business and so on. And uh, suppose I want a business partnership, right? I try to, who, who, who would be a good business partner? Okay, let's, let's, let's think. Elon Musk, why not shoot the stars? Elon Musk is going to be my business partner. Do you think I can choose him? I write an email, write a letter. Already, already I'm in the wrong road. I had to tweet maybe. Tweet, tweet him. Elon Musk, I want to be your business partner. Can someone who's much lower, smaller, choose someone so much greater than that? Normally in a business partnership, that doesn't work that way. And he decides, okay, who can I? See in Sri Lanka, see a 30 year old handsome person, oh, handsome Dan. So he's going to contact me. <laughs> he's going to contact me and uh, say, if he initiates, if he initiates the relationship, chances are that's going to last. God initiates the relationship. God is the one calling you. God is the one choosing you. He is powerful. He is mighty. He was there before time. And he's continuing to be there. He is choosing you. Think about that. Think about that. When you're going through struggle during times such as this, that God, the almighty creator, has chosen you. If I'm going to select a sports team, yeah, or maybe any team, right? There are certain criteria, right? There are certain criteria. Let's look at God, God's criteria. Let's go back to the text. God's criteria. Verse 
verse 26. Not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. This is God's team. Interesting. Not many. Huh? So if you are mighty and noble and don't think, you know, you still can make it. But not many of you. Huh? But many of the people seem to be foolish, weak, despised, flawed, broken. So these are the people in God's team. The ones who are who have their life, life is torn apart. They've messed up. They've messed up in their relationships. They've messed up in their businesses. They've messed up in their personal lives. Perhaps they are on the road. Perhaps they are fringe members in society. And God's heart goes out to them. His heart is broken towards them. He loves them. He loves them. Very different to the way we look at people. His heart goes out towards people who are despised and broken and rejected. And if you feel like you are, like, you are there at today, you feel like life has thrown so many things at you, you don't have hope. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. My friends, this message is for you. He cares for you. He loves you. You are his preferred one. You are his beloved. He has chosen Chosen you. And when he does that, when he doesn't look at social status, family background, or intelligence, when God does that, he gets the glory. God gets the glory. If he takes a broken life that is completely messed up and transforms it into something so beautiful, the person will know and the world will know it is God. He is alive. He is real. He gets the glory. You are chosen. Chosen for what? For what purpose are you chosen? My friends, we are here at this church this morning listening to me expound this text. Ask God, why are you here? At a time such as this. Esther was selected by the king to be part of his family many, many years ago. And she saw there was calamity being, being planned against the Jews. Genocide, in fact. They were going to wipe out the Jews. The king thought he had selected Esther and placed her there. But my friends, the reality is, if you read that book of Esther, it is not the king who has placed Esther there. It is God. God placed Esther at a time such as this to rescue the Jews from genocide. And she played her role. And God gave, was given glory and honor. What is your role? What is your role for a time such as this? We are the modern day Esthers placed here during difficult times, trying times, it's time for us to step up and shine. We are God's chosen people, not frozen people. You know, free, when you're frozen, you don't do anything. You just warm up the chairs. We are not God's frozen people. We are God's chosen people. Brought here for a time such as this. The, the word here talks about exalting Jesus Christ. He is so worthy to be exalted. He has chosen you. I remember when I was 17 years old, not a Christian, follower of another faith, 
going down Flower Road, that area, and uh, going to British Council at Road I've taken many, many times. On the road I should have taken was the JOC bomb. And I missed the bomb because I took a wrong turn. I missed it by five minutes. I didn't know God. I should have, I shouldn't be here. God chose me, chose to rescue me from that calamity for whatever reason. I didn't know Jesus, but that incident made me realize that life was fragile. It can be taken away like this. That's what life is. But if we trust in the living God, he can take us to heights and places we can't even imagine or plan or think of. Of course, in my life, there are times when I had to make choices. I had to make choices towards God. But I'm doing that, understanding, ultimately, He is the one choosing me. And that gives me comfort. So much comfort. I don't have to really try hard. I mean, sometimes we try to think of Christianity. Christianity equals sanctification. And we want to be holy, holy, holy. Actually, Christianity starts with justification. Looking at the cross. Looking at our hope. That is, because we are justified by Jesus Christ, it gives us strength and a hunger to be pure and to be set apart for him. It starts with the cross, the crucified Jesus Christ. So let's come, my friends, to him this morning and give him glory and honor.
As we prepare ourselves for the Holy Communion, we are reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. At this holy moment, we remember Christ's sacrifice. All of us here, we may not be broken in different areas of our lives, but we are surely broken by sin. And it was for our brokenness of sin that he gave his body to be broken. He was not taken, he volunteered. He chose to be broken for us because in that brokenness, he chose each and every one of us. He chose you, he chose me to experience his marvelous salvation. And as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup this morning, we want to give thanks to God. We want to lift up hearts of gratitude to him. We want to appreciate his sacrifice, a sacrifice that no one could have paid on our behalf. But Jesus chose to do it for us because of his great love for each and every one of us. And so we're going to partake with reverence. We're going to partake with gratitude. And we're going to realize that even as we partake together, we are one family in Christ. This is not a table or emblems belonging to any church or any denomination. As we gather here this morning, we are the family of God. And just as we belong to God, we belong to one another. So let us look to the Lord in prayer this morning and ask him to give us a new realization of his brokenness for us and a heart of gratitude for what he has done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We just come before you as your people this morning. And we want to thank you, Lord, that you chose us, that you called us by name. And even as you were hanging on that cruel cross, even as you bore those stripes on your back, even as you were insulted, we were on your mind. Thank you that you thought of us by name. Each and every one of us standing here, you thought of us by name. You called us by name. You chose us by name. And because of your great sacrifice, Lord, we belong to you. Yes, Lord, we belong to you and we belong to one another. And so even as we partake of your body and your blood this morning, we do it with a heart of gratitude, Lord. We want to say thank you from the depths of our hearts that no matter what kind of miry clay we were in, you lifted us up, O oh God, and you set our feet on solid ground. And you made us a new creation, and you give us a hope and a future in you, not just in this life, but in the life to come. And so we lift up our hearts to you and we say thank you, Abba Father. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your sacrifice. And thank you for the eternal hope that we have in you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.
Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor in all I do, I am to sing. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You are condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit lives within. Because you died and rose again Amazing love Amazing love How can it be That you, my King, should die for me Amazing love It's my joy to honor you, amazing love, amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, should die for me, amazing love. Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the assurances and the direction that you give us from your holy word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you show us how to live our lives in a manner that pleases you, which almost all the time is in direct disparity to what is happening in our world and the ways of the world. But your ways are higher. Your ways are not our own. Sometimes we don't understand your ways, O oh Lord. But you have asked us, regardless of that, to trust in you. And so we trust in you and we place our lives, we place our nation in your hands. In this coming week, no matter what takes place, no matter what kind of uncertainties are thrown at us, we know that you are in control. And for those moments where we falter, for those moments where we doubt, I pray that you will help us to refocus our minds and our hearts on the living God on the God who is walking with us through our pain and our brokenness, on the God who loves Sri Lanka and who loves each and every one of us. Help us to be worthy vessels and instruments that you can use in your time, in your way, and in our nation for such a time as this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sweet communion of the blessed Holy Spirit rest and remain with all of us now and until Jesus comes. Amen.